recycling and use wood and things like that. So I'm going to turn the program over to you. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for coming. We. Um, We've been uh, talking about this for over a year and it finally arrived and we thought last night it wasn't going to happen because we had to go about a foot of snow at our house. And uh, they came and plowed our driveway about two in the morning and then I went out this morning and dug our truck out and we made it. So, anyway, so yeah. We're tough. So, we're so tough. Anyway, we're, we want to just have um, to tell you a little bit about ourselves. We want to talk a little bit about our work. We'd like it to be more like a discussion. So if you have a question or you have something you want to say, just don't worry about waiting until the Please end. Do. Just pop it out. We'll talk about it. And uh, Nancy and I are a collaborative artist. We work together. <laughs> we are a collaborative artist. <clears throat> and for us, that means that we do everything together. And it's not like Nancy says, Tim, do this. And I say, let's make this. It's everything we do is decided together. It's a long process. It is uh, fraught with um, sometimes it's tension. Uh, sometimes it's because we're both passionate about what, we're, what we like and what we see. But quite often, we see the same thing at the same time. Not always, but often. Uh, but most of our work starts as a, as a conversation. It's either something we've seen or something we've experienced in our travels or maybe music that we like, different places we've been. And then our search starts with the wood, where we're always looking for the wood. And when we travel, um, instead of going to, a, to this place, we may go to a lumber yard or we may go to a hardware store. Or if we're in Asheville, North Carolina, we definitely go to the hardware store because in the basement, the hardware store is a, is a place where they sell wood and that's where we go and spend a couple hours and come home with pieces like this, which this piece came from North Carolina. Uh, some of the other pieces are local, but that's where we get it. most of our wood is from, um, cast offs. And, and when they make traditional lumber, uh, sawmills, they're always going to saw the board for the log first on the, all four sides. They end up with a square block that they then saw into lumber. But those first four or five pieces to come off the log, that's what we're looking for. Because those are the pieces that are, are put into piles. They're strapped together and they're sold as boiler wood, which they go into factories to, to heat cities like in Milwaukee. But all of this wood is, is, has come from that process. Uh, this is different cherry and oak and walnut and uh, uh, some of the other woods which are um, maples, and so that's where we get started. You want to say anything? We do. We look. Um, we do haunt wood piles. We have a friend who has a portable sawmill. He has learned over the years that we want those first offcuts, and we want the broken. I was speaking with your uh, Facebook lady earlier, and we want the broken pieces that are usually rejected from traditional furniture making because they're considered unstable and they don't have enough physical strength to make into furniture or to use in the, the ways that you would normally see wood. But for us, the broken elements are the first thing we look for. And then after that, we look for grain patterns and we look for uh, two other things. Most of the time, you're familiar with the heartwood of walnut or cherry, which is a deep, rich color. But right under the bark, there's a section called sapwood. It's usually lighter and it's the part of the tree that actually feeds it and helps it grow. And we showcase sapwood a lot because it's a great contrasting element to that heart wood. And it's one of the things that if we can find it, we preserve it when we debark something. Because we often get things with bark on it and it can be um, very thick and scaly. So it starts with chisels and hammers as we go through our process. The pieces that we have here, um, we brought to show you kind of, this is a piece of black walnut that was um, our friend that has a portable sawmill was splitting wood, black walnut, to burn for firewood. And he split some pieces and he called us up and he said, you know, I'm splitting this black walnut, but I think you might want to come down and see some of this grain. So we went down and we came back with our pickup full of about 12 pieces, big chunks like this, and we're starting to um, polish around these broken parts and afterwards you might have a chance to come up and see the part where the wood actually tore apart is something we're working to preserve and then polish around it so we have a real contrast between that smooth and rough surface and we have another piece on the far side that is a piece of oak that uh, while we don't use a lot of it has a, a 
swirling grain pattern, we're going to use that in what we make with it. So our inspirations are, are the wood itself at the same time, as Tim said. It's um, anything we read, it's folklore, it's uh, legend, it's uh, mythology. We're inspired by music, geology, astronomy, plays in some of our pieces, and um, obviously just our travels and our personal experiences. So we thought we would kind of show you a little bit of the progression of how things were before I worked closely with Tim in the shop and kind of how we segued through to working together. I'll show you. This is, how we, this is where we started. Um, I was, used to be a furniture maker. I made a lot of cabinets and large um, entertainment centers, boxes. But then I had a, a commission that we got. It was the biggest piece I've ever made. It took us a year to make it. It was nine feet tall and about 12 feet long. It was consisted of four pieces. It had a granite base in it. But it was a year on the ladder is what it was for me. Okay. And uh, this is, Nancy helped me with the design. We got out, had a, a CAD drawing made of the piece. It was a reproduction of a, of a very traditional piece of furniture. But after that project was over, I really I'd had enough of the ladder and wanted to do things, a different focus. Instead of the large, giant pieces in the traditional rules and regulations of how you make a piece, uh, what, uh, depending upon what tradition furniture class it was in or what year it was made. So we started to make boxes. And I'll pass this around. This is the box. This is one of our first boxes. It's just a simple little box. But it had some of our ideas already were prevalent. In other words, there's not one piece of wood. There's one, two, three, four, five separate pieces of wood to make one box. The box is made out of mahogany. The bottom is walnut. The top part is, is um, ash burl. Ash burl. I always forget this ash burl, which has been dyed red. And then the handle. So I'll just pass this around. You can't hurt it, you can't damage it. Just, and you'll feel the finish of it. You'll also notice that the grain runs around the corners too. It doesn't just stop. So I'll just pass that around. But that's how we kind of got started. Then this is the next progression would be this piece, which we call Aqua Azul, it's, it's actually a jewelry cabinet. Um, it has a couple things that's unique about it. Um, the dye, this is an aniline dye. It's a water-based dye. It's put on um, before the piece is finished, so it's, it's brought down to, the, to about 600 grit sandpaper, and then the dye is applied, and then the finish is applied over the dye, so the feel is the same no matter what, how you touch the piece. And it's a... <clears throat> It's a beautiful piece of maple. And this then the drawers have the little accents of green. And the reason that we started to yeah. use some dye in our wood is that wood is often such a traditional element. We wanted to make it more contemporary, give it a more modern feel. So one of the ways that we tried to do that was introducing color. Uh, we found that as we displayed a lot of our pieces, it was very heavily brown. <coughs> and wanted to get some life and some different, um, just a different aspect in it. So we started using this dye, which is a water-based concentrate, and we can mix it up and we can kind of play chemist and mix the yellow and the red and get the orange and um, create the colors that we want. And what we like about it best um, in this particular example and in the yellow swoop that was downstairs earlier is that it enhances wood grain as opposed to stain, which often kind of makes it more homogenous and covers different elements of a grain. So that's one of the big changes in this kind of cabinet on stand. And it was one of our pieces that's inspired by architecture. Uh, this was inspired by a, a 60s, 1960s Miami area um, of architecture called Miami Modern, as opposed to South Beach, which has kind of the Art Deco. This is Miami Modern, which is very tall, linear, skyscraper oriented as everybody was shooting for the moon and doing the space, the space race. Mm -hmm. So architecture is kind of how we interpret it in some of our boxes. And that was one of the ways that we kind of changed traditional boxes that typically we'd been making. So from the little box to the larger boxes, um, we were still trying to find really what, we, what we really wanted to make. We were kind of searching for different ideas. Uh, the boxes, um, 
we kind of got away from the boxes and we started making a swoop. Now, we, we had these at the, on the tables today. We call them swoops. Nancy designed this to showcase the grain. It's actually a lamination. There's three pieces of wood here that form this curve that put into a form, clamped together, glued tight. They sit for about three days and then we take them out. We add the trim around the outside to cover up the edges. This is mahogany. This is ambrosia maple. And the base is made out of maple. And we started this form and we took, them the, took the first one to a Art Walk, Art Walk 14, I guess it was. It's the first time we made one of them. And um, now we make them, we have made a lot of them. They're kind of a challenge because when you take it out of the form, you never know what's going to happen. It, uh, it might be stable, it might not be stable. There could be pressure if it hasn't been glued properly, if I got a clamp too tight up here maybe. They'll twist and they'll, you'll hear it. You can sit there and listen to it. <laughs> no, it'll crack. Um, so sometimes they end up being, not being usable. But again, like I said, three pieces of the wood and uh, different colors, different woods. This is, um, here's another example of, of a wood that we dyed. It's dyed yellow. It's the aniline dye with a maple base. Uh, this is one is mahogany. And this one is spalted, which um, I know that Rich knows what spalted is. It's uh, actually a form of decay. It could be caused by insect damage, it could be caused by water, but it what makes the little black lines. But this was our first venture into something that was non-functional in the sense that it's not a traditional box, not a cabinet, it's not a, it's just a piece of what we thought was something really nice. And it turned out that's been quite popular. So that was our- That was probably one of our first big discussions. We had a discussion about why does it have to be practical? Because if you make furniture and you make boxes and you know how to do that, there's a reason that you're making something or you're making a vessel and it's going to hold something. But um, for me, it's form over function a lot of the times, which isn't always the most practical thing in the world, but it's okay because it, it's still really nice. And when you're a furniture maker and box maker, it's definitely function over form. So we've got this sort of balance thing going on all the time about how big should the drawer be? Well, I think it should be about one inch by one inch, just because I want that little spot of color. And, and the answer I get is, well, what can you put in that? And it doesn't really matter, because it's just full of possibilities. You can put anything in it, you know? And, so we, we've gone around and tried to figure out that there's a balance between too small, maybe, and then there's a balance between using the drawers and creating big jewelry boxes and things like that. And one of our next pieces that went through that metamorphosis, I think, was a piece like this, which we call headwall. And I'm not sure if you can see it on here, but these are all drawers. and. Um, we selected, we selected this piece of wood very intentionally. And again, while we, a lot of our drawers and a lot of any of our casework pieces, anything that has a box that holds drawers is called casework. And those pieces, we choose the piece of wood so that the grain will actually follow all the way around, whether it's an internal box structure for a drawer or whether it's the external case. We, Tim has figured it out, and I'm not actually sure how it works all the time. I just know that if we want it to go around, he can make that work. He can cut that grain so that when we finish that, you will follow every swirl all the way around. And that's much like what we did with the faces of the drawers. We chose this piece of bird's eye maple because we think it has kind of a landscape quality. And so this is head wall, a big piece of solid maple that had a bunch of natural breaks in it at the top and along the side, which is exactly why we bought it and exactly why we found it on a burn pile. So um, we, we were looking at a kind of a commercial lumber yard. It was off in the back and it was one of the first things we saw and we knew that that was going to go home with us. Whether or not we knew what we were going to do with it wasn't as important as the fact that we knew we wouldn't find it again. So yeah, it, it sat in the shop for a year and a half. Yeah, I mean, we, we bought did. the piece, 
because there was something that spoke to us about it. Was it I, think it was, I think it was probably the, the way the grain flowed, and I think the way it was broken up here, I found that to be really attractive. And then Nancy is, enhances, this is actually bronze leafing in the top. That's, everything from sure. up here, it's hard to see with the light, but you can see the different colors. So from here on up, it's all leafed with bronze. Which and is the, another of the techniques that we've started to use. We've used bronze, gold, silver, and copper leafing on different elements of the cracks and the breaks for the most part. We try to highlight that or figure um, where the sun is going to hit this piece when it might be displayed and what that's going to look like. So. Mm -hmm. For me, head wall is kind of one of those cliffs that you ski down if you're really a great skier. And, and to me, this sort of is that break on the side of the cliff. And um, a, again, sort of the inspiration that we get when we think about naming our pieces. And I said to someone earlier, we name all of our pieces because if it kind of translates what we have seen in that piece and what we would like other people to see, but it also helps us in the shop when we say, I was thinking about that piece, you know, the other day we were working on, I want to do some gold leafing on it. And he'll say, what piece? <laughs> no clue. But if we have a working title, at least, and we know which one we're referring to each time, then we can stay on the same page and we kind of communicate better without all the arm wrestling and debating. The, 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 whole, the whole collaborative thing is, is interesting. We have a lot of people that say, well, how do you do that? I could never work with my wife. I could never do that. And, um, We've been able to do it, but it's not easy. And, and part, the part of the collaborative thing is because our medium allows us to be collaborative because we can both work on the piece. It's not like if we were a, a painter, it'd be very difficult for two painters to you know, elbow to elbow to paint. But here we can actually both work on this piece physically. Nancy will do a lot of the finish work. She does a lot of the, almost all of the leafing work. Um, she can also do a lot of the finish work. I can do some of the heavier machine work, whatever, however we work. But we both can work on the piece. So it is a truly collaborative effort to produce it. And the, before we even start working, the idea is collaboratively arrived at. Because we both know what we want to make out of the piece. We both have a name in mind. We have a narrative. We have a story. Usually, mo almost all of our pieces have a story. Um, mm -hmm. I could tell a quick story about a. We didn't understand the whole narrative thing. We are self, like I say, we're not trained artists, so we didn't understand the narrative, what that meant in art. Um, and it was not until we were at a show in Spring Green and we had a piece that we called Grieg. It was after a, a piece of music by Edvard Grieg, the Swedish composer. And as a story of the little boy and the mountain king, and maybe some of you already know the music. But we had made the piece with this mountain in the little box that I passed around. We had a little box that represented where the king had, had his treasures. And a lady had come into our booth and looked at it on, a, on two different times. She came in the morning, once again in the afternoon. And then she came back with her husband to look at it. And so now we're thinking, well, she must really like this piece. And she did, but he thought, he said, he said his thing, well, where are we going to put it? Which is always a, you know, that's where that goes. <laughs> so they talked, but they came back the next day, and I finally said to him, I think, did you, did you, did you, do you know the story of the piece? And he said no, and so I told him the story of the mountain king and the little boy. And he, his first remark was to her, we could put that right in the hallway. <laughs> so that changed the whole narrative for our story. So they bought the piece and they lived in Chicago. And then the next year, we, they, were, they came back they came to our back. booth. They came back the next year. Find us. And you're always worried when you see somebody that you've seen before, it's bought one of your pieces because you hope they still like it. They still have it. Maybe, you know, they've had second it thoughts break, about it or it, it broke, fell yeah. apart, or whatever happened to it. And so we talked for maybe five or 10 minutes. And I finally think Nancy said to her, Do you? How is, how is the piece? How's Grieg? It's called Grieg. <laughs> and she said, oh my gosh, she said, it's just wonderful. She said, and she started to tell us about the, her granddaughters. And the first thing when the granddaughters come to their house, she, they go to grandma, say, grandma, tell us a story about the little boy. Aww. And so you have And this, they always wanted to open yeah, the box. Open the box. So she put things in yeah. there for them. Oh yeah. And so you had this phenomenal connection, generations now, of the, of the piece. So it really drove home to us how critical it was for the name and the narrative of the piece, how, how important it really is. So all of our pieces are named, and almost all of them have a story. So, please. Can you tell us some more of the names that you have for some of the stories right now? Right. Uh, the question is, will you, we're, we're going to tell you all the names and all the stories. That's, that's our goal here today. So, so, so Headwall, we kind mm -hmm. of have addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and. Agua Azul, we addressed as the, as the architectural sort of piece. This was one of our um, first pieces that really 
had a significant story for us. Uh, Tim found this, we were at a friend's house in Rio who has a farm and heats with, heats with wood. So we were at the wood pile and I was looking out for snakes and he was looking for wood. <laughs> And found this piece which was um, this was the front cut part and the back of it was all covered in bark so we started to take the bark off and um, if you come up here later or even at any point there are wrinkles and it's very interesting to me that when a tree grows and a branch comes up I never knew this till we started finding them underneath the bark the actual hardwood will wrinkle and we call them wrinkles because it's almost like an elephant knee or something where it bends and it creates little ridges and you don't always get them but when you do if you can keep them we think it's great so we were working on that and tell, us, tell the story of where the piece started as far as what, why we made the piece we were approached um, by an Alzheimer's fundraiser Alzheimer's disease fundraiser to donate a piece for Alzheimer's which is something that is close to us because my dad suffered from Alzheimer's. And this piece, we started looking at this more and more and I felt the narrative of this piece is that for me, from a straight on view that you can see, this is a very amorphous human form to me. It's just an outline, very hazy, and it's almost like it's kind of compressing into this one area. So it's just sort of the heart of that person that's left. And as Alzheimer's progressed, for me, that was what I saw, fuzzier and fuzzier edges and less and less of my dad that I knew. And so we started thinking about this piece that we'd had in the shop. And if you want to turn it, I don't know. We were working with bending wood at that time. so. My memory of my dad was strength, obviously. You know, you think that your dad is powerful and strong and um, can withstand anything. So we created this bent wood as the structural element. It's not what you see when you look at it head on, because when you look at that person as they're kind of diminishing and disappearing, at first glance, that's all they are but you remember that strength and you remember that structure in your life. So we created this by bending the wood, which is another technique that we use. And we ended up putting a box in here. And we wanted, we used this ash burrow and green to me is the color of spring and everlasting newness, rebirth. And this is the special place for me where everything that person still was inside, even though you can't see it from straight on, it's still there. And so this whole piece was how we kind of articulated that pathway of Alzheimer's. And as it turned out, we took far too long to make this piece for the event. So we offered another piece for the auction and the fundraiser and we finished this and we've decided that this is something we're always going to keep. This is just going to stay with us wherever we live. It's called so, uh, in, in My Mind's Eye. In My Mind's Eye is the name of the piece. So the title mm -hmm. of this piece is mm -hmm. In My Mind's Eye and that's sort of, I think the tie, you remember in your mind's eye and you just sort of trust that they still have that memory somewhere within them even if they can't speak it out. Mm -hmm. So everything about this piece, from reclaiming it to working through that whole story, came together in that way. And this, this is um, Wisconsin black walnut, and the ash burl is on the side, but it was just this concept of not everybody's what you see at first glance. So that was our story for that piece. Where are we gonna go next? What does it say? Oh, should we go to our list? <laughs> it says we should talk about Sweetwater. Okay. This piece is called Sweetwater. It's um, a piece that Nancy did all of this part. I did this part. Uh, the idea was collaborative on ours part. It, uh, I'll show you the back of it, and we can set it back down. But this we is the back about, of the piece. We talked this about is the, sapwood. This is, this is sapwood for cherry. This is cherry, right? Mm -hmm. This is all cherry, which is immediately under mm -hmm. the bark, mm -hmm. which 
um, we, again, chiseled off and, and tried to keep a, a lot of the natural break or bowl. There was a, a burl or something in that space, a branch. And when it came out, it created, it created the hollow and it created the space on the back. But our feeling about this my feeling especially from the very first was that from this I saw it as it absolutely saw it as a cave to me it was a cavern or an abyss and we worked on polishing it and we worked on cleaning it up and it kind of took a while because there was just a lot of material that we wanted to get rid of at the same time working to preserve a lot of the striations within there and, and to keep it in one piece because it was, it was a real challenge and ultimately um, we had to put it back together. But um, it was very much for me a, a place of depth. Again, the geology connection for me was strong in this piece and what I, I wanted to see happen and what we were able to get done is a feeling of that black still water underground that if you've been in a cave or if you've seen a place like that that it's that perfectly still reflection but you can't tell that it's water necessarily so Tim worked on the base to get it to give me that high shine and that polish and I started looking online and trying to figure out um, a little bit about how can we name this piece then what can this be because I thought about abyss I thought about Styx, the river Styx, as you go into Hades and Dante's Inferno, and just different things like that. And it seemed very, it seemed kind of, um, it's kind of heavy, <laughs> it's a little deep, but um, I we were also We were also getting ready to go to a show in Memphis mm -hmm. um, in October, so this was a piece we were getting, trying to get ready for Memphis. Mm -hmm. and that, also affected the name because so we googled yeah. caves just underwater caves underground caves underground lakes and it turned out that the second largest freshwater underground lake in the country is at in Tennessee in a town called Sweetwater so we went ahead and named it and then at the second day of the show Tim talked to a woman in our booth who came up and said I've been there I know right where that is. We used to take our boys because you can enter the cave from outside in a boat and go in. And I've never been there, and now I need to go in there. Mm -hmm. But um, our whole feeling about this piece was that wood can look like water on that one, but wood can look like stone. And the back of it, to me, looks like ivory. So it takes on a different persona depending on what we decide to do with it and that, that was what we did with this piece and why we liked it and as much for the back, so it's kind of a nice piece on a pedestal, but as much for the back with the curves, the natural curves in that element. So we worked to preserve all those kinds of things, both the jagged part and the smooth part. Um, here's another example of, um, this, this piece is called Ice Moon, or Silver Moon, uh, in the North American, uh, native culture. They always name the moons for the period of the year, like the hunger moon or the sky moon or the July moon or the corn moon, whatever the word is. This is called ice moon. This was another version of it, uh, which we called hunger moon. But this is actually all wood. This is a, a laminate that's been put together and then uh, airbrushed to, to make the ice. This is cherry. And this piece represents the winter of when the ground is frozen and in the Native American culture you couldn't hunt, couldn't forage for food. So it was a very really tough time. So they're called hunger or, or barren moon. We call it this one ice moon. And this is all a black lacquer painted on walnut. This is cherry and like they, this is maple that's been airbrushed to silver. That's what it is. So this one is the same way. It's cherry and the black lacquer. And the base is also a wall that's been painted with black lacquer. But again, an example of where our inspiration came, um, knowing what the culture was and what it must have been like, trying to represent that feeling of January, what it's like. We should know that in Wisconsin what it feels like. So, <laughs> so. Just that desolation time. Yeah. And those are, piece, those are cross-cut sections of a trunk 
that had probably decayed through the center and killed the tree, whether it was hit by lightning first or whether it just was attacked by organisms or bugs or anything else that took it down. But once it was down, we did um, some cross-cut elements on it, and that's how we get that piece. Mm. So we start with a big round piece, cut it in slices, and then we determine how big we want to make the piece and where we can make our cuts. So our cuts here were very intentionally made for size for two reasons. One, we have to be able to put our moon into that. We have to make, we want the moon to look like it's holding that suspended piece of earth and give you that kind of landscape feeling as you look at it. So each of them, um, each of our pieces is pretty much always one of a kind, but when we start using those kinds of pieces, they're even more so because if we, if we break it, we can't just go cut another piece that looks just like it. So um, we're kind, they're kind of delicate, they're kind of tough, but they're kind of delicate. So when we clean them out, we use an array of brass and metal brushes. We use um, small rasps and files and work on them with that because we want to preserve what's already there without um, taking too much of it away. So our goal when we work on most of these as is probably apparent, is keeping a very organic feel of that wood. We don't want to change it a whole lot. We just kind of wanted to showcase what we see and then make it so that other people can see hopefully what we see, but we can hear what they see in it also. So we've had pieces where we display them and someone says, oh, that's a lion, and we say, Yes, <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> and they show us what they see in a piece, which is one of the best things about having other people see your work, because they don't always get the same thing that you got. And we love to kind of hear what their input is on pieces like that. So. Out of curiosity, how long does it take you to do some of these pieces, and how hard is it to sell them? Because you kind of put your heart and soul into it. Well, time-wise, just the, the simple production is is usually a couple three months because of the drying time and all the curing time that has to happen. Um, quite often, because of the collaborative nature of our relationship, we may get to a point on a piece that we we're stuck, that we come to an impasse as far as where we're going to go with this piece. So, what we have learned after the bitter experience of trying to convince each other, which that doesn't work. Uh, the convincing is not part of the collaborative process. Um, it has to be a, you have to arrive at it naturally. So if I try to convince Nancy that this is what we're gonna do, or my idea is the best, I mean, that doesn't work. It has to be something that we come to because we both have the same vision. So what we do in those cases, we just put it aside. Because we always have um, five or six pieces going on any one time, because of the, this is drying or that's being glued or whatever. So we have many pieces at the, we work on. So we just put it aside and wait it, and we'll come back sometimes maybe six months later and with a different attitude, <laughs> change my attitude, and uh, then we're able to, to come to a conclusion and finish the piece up. So the answer to your question is usually it's several months for each piece. We have, when we go to a show, we did uh, nine shows last year. We started in Florida with two shows in February, then we went to Minneapolis, we went to Memphis, we went to Oconomowoc, we went to Chicago did a show in Madison, plus we do things like this on occasion. So we, and we have 20 pieces or 25 pieces in our booth at any one time. So we have to have something like 40 or 45 pieces to go to a show in order to be able to replace the stock with things sell. So that's, that's, yes? It appears that we are looking at a very large number of pieces We have some, I guess. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we, have, we have won some best of shows. Um, when we first started out, it was easier. Now we're trying to do um, higher quality shows, more difficult shows to get in, jury shows like you know, Uptown in, in Minneapolis, plus shows like that, or in the floor, go to Mount Dora or, or New Smyrna Beach. Um, it's very difficult to win a best of show at a show like that. So if we get an honorable mention or we get somebody, a judge comes up and talks to us, that's pretty good. It's really tough to, to win the best of show at a big show like that. So we keep trying. Yes? How do you, do you seal some of these pieces? Like, the blacks, you mentioned 
all the pieces are finished the same way. We start with, a, uh, with, this, with the sanding process. Once we get down to uh, where it's perfectly smooth and there are no imperfections in basically with how the light hits it. Then we start with an oil varnish and each coat is put on by hand with a rag. They're wiped on and then usually put on like two or three coats at one time and then we'll sand it off. Almost all of it comes off. It's sanded down so it becomes as a, that you start building the finish up. And usually there's between five and 15 coats before it, it comes out and feels like this. And then when that's all done, it dries for three or four days and then we use four out steel wool, just it has four zeros and wax. And we put the wax in the steel wool and it's hand polished with the steel wool and the wax. And so that is, will make it somewhat water impervious. It'll make it good for the moisture. And then you can repair it. You can also just re-wax re it. So after a piece sits in your house for a couple of years, it may get fingerprints on it and stuff. It can just be re-waxed. But the finish should last for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the drying in between each coat, which is important because obviously we're getting ready to do a show on Thursday and we're looking for a piece. You want to push it, and that is a big mistake because you're going to end up with a mess. So you have to be very, very patient. Yeah, it's but, hard to take off that oil varnish finish when you've overdone it because I'm, it, yeah. I can be like, put that on there, and it won't dry correctly. It will dry, but it, it's sort of like if you put on a really thick coat of nail polish instead of two thin ones, it's always sort of murky and just not right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and it's happened, and that means the next thing is take it off. Take it off, back over. down to the wood and start over. Which, which is good, because it is forgiving from that standpoint. However, you've just made a lot of extra work for yourself. So, yeah. um, it's better slow, and, and weather affects it greatly as far as drying time and things like that. So, we think about that a little bit, if it's going to be raining. We have, when we bought our, our property, we built the shop on the property before we built the house. Because, and I said to Jane that we had, um, before we started working together, Tim built the furniture in the house, built the newel posts, all the stair, stair railings, milled all the door, window, and baseboard trim, built all the fireplace surrounds, all of that kind of thing. So the shop was very utilitarian, but it does, and so it has a furnace, it has a heater in it. Mm -hmm. And when we're working with this, we have to be careful to get the heat up so that things dry correctly and, and um, we can go ahead with those next coats in a timely manner. But you asked how we sell things. How hard and difficult is it once you put your heart and soul into the piece? That's kind of kind of tough to, to put it out there to sell it and it's gone. It's, we try to take a lot of photographs because we don't make the same thing twice, per se, but we're inspired maybe to have a different sort of cabinet on stand if we're going to make another one. Um, we are probably, I think a lot of artists, if you make something that you really love and you are going to put it out there, if somebody else really loves it, that's not so hard. You know, you know it's, it's, it's going to a great home with somebody who loves it. And, I see people and they come up to us, like the story of Grieg, and, and I can say, you know, is that piece, is that piece still in your sunroom? Because they'll tell us where they're going to put it, you know, oh, I'm going to hang it right here, or it's going to go in this niche or this alcove. And, and I just remember these pieces. I know these pieces. I know which ones had wall and which ones sweet water and which ones ice moon or barren moon or any of the others. And I often remember the people because we sold a piece in Memphis, and she said, I've been looking for something for five years mm -hmm. for that wall. Five years. This is it. I'm going to remember her. Yeah. That's a dedicated search. Yeah. So when people say, oh, I love that. This is going home with me. I'm like, you betcha it is, because you love that piece, and it's easier then, you know. Mm -hmm. And some pieces... That's just, that would never be easy, that's staying with us. So we made it, we learned that occasionally there's a piece that resonates so much it just needs to stay with us. But probably we've sold a piece or two that we wish we hadn't. <laughs> but. Yeah, but the other thing is, if, if we, we made the decision several years ago to, to, do, to do the art shows, to try to do art show circuits, we really wanted to find out if we could be successful doing that. Um, 
So that opens up another whole area of, of, of thought because the financial part of it is very different if you're trying to make ends meet. If you're trying to add to your income or you're trying to just break even or you want to go to a show because it's a lot of fun. Um, we pretty much made the commitment that the art shows have to be financially um, at least break even. We can't, it's not something we're going to be pouring money into. So um, that makes it, that gives you a little different emphasis so that when a piece is appreciated, then you have not only the reason that they, that you know they're going to enjoy it, but it does help financially because it's very expensive to, to do the art shows and to travel and have the truck and the trailer and the tents and all the stuff we have in the, so I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Yes, go ahead. Transporting these. Mm -hmm. Do they have special boxes? They're all wrapped, yeah. The question is, how do we transport it all? And it's a very, it takes a long time. We have a trailer. A lot of the things are boxed. They're put in the plastic tubs. They're all wrapped in plastic. They're put blankets around every piece. And we always have, not always, but very rarely, or very often we have damage. It just, it just happens. Because of the setting up, tearing down, you know, moving things we're around. We're careful, though. Um, we're, we've actually been lucky that we, I think we had a swoop one time come away from its base because it, it racked in the trailer. But um, those are repairable. They're yeah. going to be available for that event. Um, Tim is, you know, we not only built our house together, we ran an interstate trucking company together that we founded from scratch. So that's a packing genius over there. You know, we, we've got our trailer outfitted with shelves is specifically designed in places we have a 10 by 10 foot tent and all of the display pieces like these tall ones that all fit together with clamps and create an actual room within our tent and we do that to make people maybe be able to envision how that's going to look in a home setting and um, so that when they walk in they feel like they're in a new environment they're not walking on the street anymore they've gone into kind of a little gallery place and I think that feels different for them, so they look at things differently when they do that. But when we pack, it's a couple day operation. And we have the non-weather sensitive things go in first, and then the day that we're gonna leave, that's when all the artwork goes in. And if it's 40 pieces or 36 pieces, it's, we have it all sort of staged and packed and, and try to make sure it's waterproof and moisture proof. And I collect all those little desiccant things that go in here, and I put them in the drawers when we were in Florida. It rained in February. Oh, 175% humidity. So our drawers were not happy because there's, Tim's... There's one in that drawer, too. All the drawers have to. <laughs> Exactly. They're all, they're all they stuck in there. They just live in there. Because <laughs> that way, it, it's happened to us before. If it's raining outside, these drawers will tighten up. And then, of course, you know, people don't understand why it's tightened up, and they think something wrong with it. But if you take it home, and, <laughs> yeah. and that, the next day it's fine. But it's, you can't sell something under that condition. So, so yeah. we we um, think a lot about what the weather's mm -hmm. going to be, and we think a lot about how rough the road can be, mm -hmm. and and all that comes into yeah. consideration. Nancy, it sounds like um, moisture content is really important. Mm -hmm. Good question, because we, we don't gauge it, and there are um, hygrometers and things like that, that um, humidity measurements that people can use for wood. Um, if we go with, if we get a brand new piece of wood that has a lot of bark on it, and we start taking off the bark, you can actually just feel it's wet. It's not soaking, but it just is cool to the touch, and it doesn't feel like dry wood feels. And so um, it's in our shop maybe for a month or two before we start, or if we get the bark all off, we just kind of let it rest for a while and mm -hmm. sit. But mm -hmm. it's a, even though it's dry, it's kiln dried or it's dry wood, it wood always kind of has a reaction to its environment. It's kind of a, a living entity from that standpoint. It's not stable like plastic or something that never will change. So it is an issue with the drawers and you know we kind of tell people that and um, 
it's want something that I would guess we would always have in consideration and we would always be aware of and sometimes we would always fight it. So it's, it's a big deal. Humidity and wood are not the best companions. Let's go on to the last, this is the last piece? Yeah, the last piece. This is the last piece. <clears throat> it's called uh, Sentinel. This is a piece of oak. This is the raw material. This is what it, lo it kind of looked like. This, is, this came from our sawmill down in Edgerton. Uh, Rich had three of these pieces. They were like this, but they were, he had put them off the saw and thrown them in the dirt, basically, or the dust. And so they were curved. They were like, this piece probably went from about here to like that. And, but Nancy and I both saw the same thing immediately. And for us, it was a vision of this tree and some type of a rock formation. So we saw the sentinel, the tree, um, beaten down, weather-worn, standing up there in the cold for 100 years. And so we call it sentinel. And our, our basic goal then was to try and showcase this piece of wood to make it so you could see it. And so how to get the curve out of it? Um, I gently put it into a clamp uh, on my table and began to pull it down. And every day I would tighten it a little bit, almost like straightening your teeth. And every day I just Braces. pull a little bit more because uh, I didn't want it to crack because it was very fragile. This, this, this piece, you can see it, it, even a little bit of looseness there. Um, this is, and it didn't cooperate real well. It didn't like that. Um, but eventually it, I got most of it out. And so it, even now it's under probably some stress because I've got it, I have it fastened down to the base and the base is holding it stable. Um, I don't think it's going to ever blow apart, but it, it's, it had a lot of energy that we got out of it. And then we added the shelf. And this piece is, we, we call it wabi-sabi. Yep, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the term wabi-sabi, what it means. Um, it's the, for us, it's the art of perfecting something the that's... The perfection in, of imperfection. All right. Mm -hmm. So we took this rather tough-looking piece of wood, um, with its big hole in the bottom and the bark ripped apart on it and being curved and tried to make it into something that you could appreciate. And so we framed it in black. We purposely set it off center. And we added a little shelf. Sometimes we will display it with a stone or another piece of wood. Uh, but sometimes it's just like this too. And it's kind of where, I think this piece represents more where we are now than, than all the other pieces. We, this is kind of where our journey is, is today. Uh, we'd love to take a piece of wood like this and, and, and reclaim it, bring it back, and make it into something we think is, is striking. Uh, it's finished with the same process. This is just sealed over with a little, little tiny brush so that it doesn't have any uh, flaking. And then the wood is just polished, and it's mounted to, the, to this back. And, that, that particular piece, when we saw it, had such a pictorial quality. We just felt that it already was, it already showed itself to the best, uh, the best way that it could, and we, all we did was take away all the extraneous things. We took away the big saw marks, and we took away... Um, the big bend. The, yeah. big, the biggest bend, though, from the side, you can see that we made a very deep frame to contain that curve, that sort of spinal curve on that, and keep that as all part of it. So to keep the pictorial quality was our, our real goal on that piece. And to every once in a while, we found a piece of wood that has a grain pattern that has its own um, picture. We've, we've made two, three pieces, maybe, that were so apparent and just so readily visible that we didn't mess with it. Sometimes, you know, you just need to learn to edit it. We, we've learned a lot about editing and scaling back and how less can be more, which is a, a big thing for us to learn, how, me especially, how less can be more. Mm -hmm. Do you consider carving any of it at all? Do we consider carving? Something else. Um. It's close to the way we found it. We trimmed it. We sort of kept the focus on that. Um, it's not carved, per se, like some of these other pieces are. 
we... I, I think... Go ahead. I, I don't think we... We don't really carve anything. Uh, we might clean something up, like this piece, which was had big hunks of bark on it. Um, it re we didn't carve anything. We just cleaned it up and got it down to where it was naturally where it was. So in this piece, I, was, I mean, I think I maybe took off some broken pieces on it, but all of this is exactly the way it was when we found it. Mm -hmm. We, it yeah, these, these we shape more. I guess we don't consider them to be carved per se. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of shaping, but and we um, mostly do it so that all the parts that we want to see are what you see and you're not kind of mm -hmm. distracted by things that don't mm -hmm. really matter in what our vision for the piece was. So we do. We use um, hand sandpaper. We use uh, rotary sanders we use they're commercial grade we use chisels rasps which are small little files and then we use big files sometimes hammers and rubber hammers because it hurts much less when I hit myself <laughs> with a rubber hammer and um, I think that we actually use our saws all we use we saw parts off intentionally we smooth things over intentionally on occasion because if I don't want to bump or a bulge somewhere on a piece of wood, I'm not above deciding that that doesn't belong there. You know, that should be gone because it's, it's distracting to me for what I want the finished piece to be. So... Do the pieces evolve um, as we work on them? I would say yes, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm just trying to, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. I, this piece, I think about it, this is exactly the way the, the, this part of the log is exactly the way it was. None of this is created. This is all natural. Now, this might have been full of dirt or junk or soft wood cleaned up, but all of these lines are natural. They're not created. Um, so our idea here was to, to cut this piece to get whatever the focal point was, which I, 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 to me is right about here. I get a little off center that, but so the, the the carving thing is it's hard to explain I guess because it's not carving per se to create a shape it's really just to get what we think is already there. Yes, right. You try to and make it. Era asked about the evolution of a mm -hmm. piece as we mm -hmm. work on it, and mm -hmm. I would say that they do often mm -hmm. go through an evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. We're I'm trying to think. I don't think we have one here, but. Boy, if I have an idea of something I, and how I want it to be, that is it, man. I want that piece. And we've had to realize that it's just not going to go there. It is never going to go there. Or push it to the point where you think it's there and it's just not what I had in mind at all. Well, this is awful. I hate that. But, and then we either revisit that whole concept or... We, we tweak it somehow or else we do what Tim said, we put it aside for six months because mm -hmm. this thing is not working for us right There's now. There's one of the woodworkers that we, um, and Rich might know this gentleman, James Krenoff was a woodworker from Sweden, came to this country, was in California at Fort Bragg at the School of Arts there, very prominent furniture maker. But his thing, which I've always followed and Nancy I think agrees with me, is that the joy is in the making, therefore that joy should be present in the finished piece. That's what he always said. And when you think about that, um, a piece that you're forcing or a piece that you're struggling with or a piece that is not, um, you're trying to do something that maybe the, the wood is, doesn't agree to with. I mean, it sounds like the wood is, has a saying in it, but it actually does. You, you can't force something like this to be what it is. It has to be that. All, we're, all we are is just stewards to try and enhance it or try to make it what our vision is. It, but. I don't know that's, if I'm saying it has to but. It just kind of has to be naturally right, I think. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we've found ourselves overworking something. And I know our friends in, who are painters say, oh, I painted that again, and I painted that again, and I painted it again, now I'm going to roll it all white and quit because I overworked it. It just doesn't, it's not, it's not easy anymore or natural. And the same thing can happen with these pieces. And for us, taking something like the cabinet on stand to a very simple form and deciding what it is we want to focus on and agreeing that that's what we're going to focus on um, 
has simplified that, but the evolution of it can be painful sometimes, just painful. Like yes. Yeah, or a strike. <laughs> <laughs> I am on strike. <laughs> Yes. You, you get these surprises. It doesn't sell. Yes. Mm -hmm. so you, oh, surprises are a great thing. And if you're a, I think, I think of watercolors, and I don't know who all does the watercolors here, but it flows. It goes where sometimes it wants to. And things happen sometimes, you know, that, well, I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to be quite that color. I didn't know how that grain pattern was actually going to look when we showcased it. And it's a good thing. It turned out to be a good thing. Are your students kind of uh, in an evolution to something that is simple? So you can tell me So it goes around a very, very long So similar. How did that Our swoop and how it occurred. It, the first thing about our swoops, I think, and First of all, it was to showcase wood grain. They're, they're long and narrow. There's not a lot of things that we can make that showcase that. And grain can have such a sweeping movement. So I think that swoops were created hugely, first of all, to showcase wood grain. Mm -hmm. And then my question was, well, how come it has to be flat? You know, could we do something else? And we started to talk about it, and Tim built a jig, which is a form. And when we, um, then we find the wood that we want. They're a sixteenth of an inch thick, mm -hmm. the three layers typically. So we, we have to thin them down. So we use machines to get them down, pick the sides that we want to showcase, put them with glue, wood glue into this jig with typically 34 to 36 clamps. And that's what, and ensure it hasn't slid, it hasn't moved, what's the, the goal? And all of that is just to get that kind of motion where if you're walking past it on your buffet or on your table, you can reach out and you can just kind of say hello to that little swoop. <laughs> and it, it's all for, we choose wood for those specifically for wood grain. That's our very first place we go. We choose ribbon mahogany, we choose spalted maple. and. Our goal is, you know, when that hits the light, and you go, wow, I've never seen wood that looked like that before. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a simple form, and it was in the more simple form gives you the more complex wood grain. So you get a little balance in that, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you ever add lighting to your work? We always, like we always light our booth, right? But no, I mean, like, if you're, if you're making a piece. To add lighting to a piece. Oh, I'm sorry, I just think you said that. No, no, we don't okay. normally. Um, we have looked at pieces that we thought would be really cool. They were, we had a piece of walnut one time that was all tore apart inside from ants. We thought, well, that'd be kind of nice. But we, we have not done that, and we kind of shied away from it. We just want to work with the wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. And have you mm -hmm. ever done any wood? Because we split wood all the time. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, my house was just a split away, and I'm going, oh, stop, wait. <laughs> yeah. Call Tim and Nancy, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's oh, wait, I gotta find yeah. that card. And I'm actually pull pieces aside. <laughs> yeah. But um, I find it fascinating how it looks when the bark falls off uh, wood that has worm damage. Right. Mm -hmm. And you got all these paths. Yeah, we've, yes. been, we've worked with that before, yeah. yeah. We have. Right. Does that come out really nice? It we actually made, yeah, we, made a, we made a couple pieces with, like swoops. Okay. They were centerpieces, made all that bark with the, turned uh -huh. upside down with the, with the patterns in it, yeah. yeah. We we've had also a, done a, with, yeah. where we've um, painted it black and then sanded off the top, so now you have the black lines left. We had yeah. a great piece, we called it yeah. hieroglyph, mm -hmm. because all those mm -hmm. trails, when they were black against a lighter wood, looked like tomb drawings almost. They just mm -hmm. were, uh, they had a really interesting aspect to them. Mm -hmm. and. Um, a young couple with a baby in a stroller bought it. I'll, mm -hmm. I remember this couple because it's hieroglyph and they bought it at Oconomowoc. And um, he was so excited about that part of it. He recognized what that was. Okay. So when people connect like that, that's a great thing because you don't always find that under the bark. And if you do, with the chisels, you know, it's easy to lose it. 
or um, there's another element under a lot of the bark that is called cambium. And it's a very thin layer. It's very almost pulpy and soft, mm -hmm. but it looks like alligator. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. special when we find it. And we have showcased that before too. Mm -hmm. So we have worked to preserve it which is a, a very slow process of getting everything off down to that layer without breaking it. But when we get that, it, it can be striking and it finishes beautifully. Mm -hmm. So there are just different things you can discover. It's, I suppose it's like, again, it's like when two colors come together in watercolor and they do their own thing and you think, I could never have made that happen, but I'm not gonna touch that, it's perfect. So. It's, it's just those things that you find, and if you get them early enough before you've gone past it. Well, when we do, of course, the wood sap for a while. So when they pick it up and you plop it down and the wood splitter comes <laughs> off the bark, and there's all this mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Interesting yeah. things, mm -hmm. interesting textures, mm -hmm. interesting yeah. figures. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we have to be a little bit careful of wood like that because people are concerned about its durability mm -hmm. or whether it has you know, the ants are still in it, so people get real concerned about that, so. so. Yeah, Any other questions? Like I think we're You don't want to, yeah. you don't want a drone, no droning. Yeah. Are but, the pieces that you brought today, except for the one for sale um, today? They can be. I think they were, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, that's the only one that's not, yeah, 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 but. Yeah. Thank you again. We really appreciate we the opportunity enjoyed. to talk to you. We have really enjoyed it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.